Hello everybody, today we're going to take a look at dynamic crop masks or data windows or domain of definitions, however you want to call it, as well as overscan inside of Houdini, specifically in Solaris, where we can use this with Karma. If you're new, you might want to watch the whole video to understand what the problems are and why we want to fix this and how we can work with these data windows. But if you know all of that, please use the chapters below to jump to the part that actually is interesting to you. I'm going to show you a tool that I've made, or HDA, that you can use and download. And I'm also going to cover how this tool works in case you want to build upon it or build it yourself. And we're also going to cover why we want a dynamic data window and how to work with those inside of Fusion. Okay, let's begin by demonstrating what the domain of definition actually is inside of Houdini first. Later we're going to look at this in Fusion. Here I have a very simple scene. It's just a sheet falling down. And I have a Mantra node right here. So I'm going to render this with Houdini's older render engine, Mantra. And I'm going to render this to Mplay. The buckets, these are these rectangles. This is the part where it's currently rendering. And while those are very, very fast in areas where there is no geometry, it still takes some time. Here, have you seen at the end, all these parts where nothing is? Those are wasted resources. And if we can optimize this, why not? Because Mantra and Houdini are quite sophisticated, there is a built-in tool for that inside the camera of our scene. So right here, I go to View, under Crop Mask, and I'm going to select the sheet. The crop mask will simply create a bounding box that covers the object in screen space or in camera space and prevent Mantra from rendering anything outside of this area. So let's render this again. And now we have seen that the buckets, the part that's going to be rendered, did not cross the bounding box of our object. So all this wasted space right here was ignored. And for a simple scene like this, the, the gain isn't too dramatic, but there are a few seconds that we've saved. And depending on the scene, if it's more complex or if your resolution is even higher, the gains will be better. And if you have hundreds of frames, you will notice this. So let's head over to Solaris and or the stage context or LOPS, 50 names for the same thing. And let's take a look at how we would handle this there. So here we are in Solaris. And this is a similar and simple scene. There are only a couple more objects. All these objects and textures and HDRIs are from Polyhaven, which is an amazing platform and catalog of textures, models, and HDRIs. I've linked them below. And let's take a look at our camera to see if on the view we have the same settings as our standard Houdini camera. And no, there's no parameter. If you look on a camera, there's a screen window parameter. This might look like the correct one, but it's not. We don't actually want to change this for what we're going to do. So we can find this setting on our render product, data window NDC, or on the render settings. You can find the setting on our Karma HDA also under image output and aspect ratio. There we have data window. The tooltip actually explains this quite well. This is also used for overscan. X0, Y0, and goes to 1, 1, similar to the coordinate system inside of Fusion. But even on our render product, we don't have any way of creating a dynamic crop mask. So this is where my tool comes into play. I'm going to place this down, calculate data window. And this requires a camera and the primitives that you want. By default, it will choose every single primitive that can be bound by a bounding box. And for this scene, my camera is also called camera one, so this works. But if your camera is called anything else, for example, camera A, you would need to place this right here. And we can already see that right here, this is our calculated data window. I'm going to look through my camera. And I'm also going to make the calculate data window HDA visible. And I'm going to set visualize window. 
this will create a box which will show us where our actual window is. You can choose between filled or borders and change the color. The opacity doesn't actually work yet, but I assume it will in the future, so I've already published this parameter. But you can also change the visualization depth to see the bounding box behind your geometry. Since I don't yet know how Python states work, this is actual geometry in your scene. This will not be rendered. This is set to guide geometry, so USD will never render this. Um, but it is actual geometry with a USD preview shader to be visible. So let's go back into our camera. And if we go for forth and back, we can see that our data window is being adjusted. We can also change the padding. And we can also clamp to the screen. This means that our data window will not go beyond our screen edges, meaning no overscan. Now all you need to do is copy the parameter and paste the relative reference to this channel. And now we have a dynamic data window on our camera HDA or whatever render engine you're using. Let's head into Fusion to see how we can work with this data window and what this actually means. Okay, here we are in Fusion and I have once rendered this with the data window and once without. To visualize the data window inside of Fusion, we can click under region to show domain of definition. This is our data window and here region show domain of definition. Here we can see the data window filling the complete resolution, everything from zero to one. If you look at the merge right here, the text you can see is the render time. This is simply taken out of our metadata. Here we have the render time metadata in seconds. The render time for our smaller data window is always slightly lower. It's not a dramatic change simply because our resolution is very small and camera isn't actually that bad at ignoring pixels where nothing is. In my testing, I've seen that it's not as dramatic as in Mantra, for example, but there are slight gains. And over time, this will add up to a sizable difference, especially with higher resolutions. But the real gains come from calculating all other nodes in your compositing pipeline in a much smaller area. Let's take a look at the defocus. Both of our loaders are completely cached to our RAM. So IO times don't really matter right now. Now we're going to play just the defocus with the smaller data window. And as you can see, we hover between nine to 10 frames per second. It's a little slower when the data window is bigger. But let's compare that to the defocus node that has to calculate the whole image at all times. Here we have 3.5 to 4 frames per second. So we have roughly doubled the performance because we're calculating a smaller data window. If you don't have the luxury of having a dynamic data window right outside of your rendering engine, you can use Fusion's auto domain tool, which will crop your domain to visible pixels, which is incredibly helpful. So if we now take a look at this, this might actually be faster because the domain is even smaller than our 3D render domain. Yeah, it's, it's even faster. So in many cases, it's actually a very good idea to just place down the auto domain or set the domain manually. You can also use set domain. You can use to adjust the domain manually or you can copy this from another node. So you have a lot of tools right inside of Fusion to work with your domain and to adjust it and most importantly to benefit from smaller render times. Right now we are only using this dynamic data window to decrease the area that we're rendering. But we can actually use this for overscan as well. So if we increase the padding and disable clamp to screen, you can see that our data window goes beyond our edges of our camera, indicated by negative numbers here in our minimum X and Y and numbers above one in our maximum X and Y.
This means that the image that we're going to render is still in the same resolution that we specify in our render settings. But Houdini, or in this case Karma, will render more than this resolution. And this is only possible in EXRs, by the way. You will not find a data window setting for PNGs, for example. But what's the point of having an overscan? Right here, I have this very basic particle animation. And you can see I have a dynamic data window. But this time, our data window goes beyond our edges. This means if I move this up, our image goes beyond our resolution. And there is information in our pixels beyond 720p, which is the resolution that we've rendered at. And I'm going to use the set domain to explain the issue. The set domain will now crop our domain to our image borders. And this particle animation isn't particularly beautiful. So we need to add a lot of stuff to make this look good. First, I'm going to make this all a little bit brighter so it pops more. And next, I'm just using a couple of blurs to sort of fake an exponential glow. Next, I'm going to use the Vari Blur. The Vari Blur will, as the name suggests, blur the image to different degrees based on a map that we put in. I usually create a background node and just use a brightness contrast to control the area that where I want a lot of blur, uh, which are these bright red areas. And the less red we have, the less it's going to be blurred. So let's take a look at a prominent example right here on our image edges. We have these bright blue particles and they just plop into the image. And in many cases, this might be the expected behavior or this might be the look you're after, but I don't like the plopping in like that. So this is where an overscan is really nice. So I'm going to disable my set domain. And now we can see that our domain is bigger again. And our particles don't plop in, but we can already see the light blur and hue of our particle coming in. Because right now Fusion is calculating everything, including the domain beyond our resolution. Again, this is with our overscan, and this is without. So the variable is actually a little bit special in the way that it handles the domain because it uses a second image as the blur strength with a fixed resolution. Meaning that if I'm going to take this image up after our variable, we can see that it didn't actually blur outside of our edges. Usually this isn't a problem, but if you were to merge this or transform this for whatever reason, and you need this to be blurred as well, you can just increase the domain of your previous image with a transform, increasing the width or height, meaning the resolution doesn't actually work, but increasing the domain using a transform tool does work. Because of all the effects that we've added after our particle sim, it doesn't actually look like crap anymore. So this right here are the settings that I've used for the particles data window. So I did not enable clamp to screen, I have a padding of 5%, meaning 5% beyond our uh, image resolution, there can be a data window. But since this is dynamic, this will only happen if our geometry actually reaches that point, if this is actually necessary. And this also you know, shows quite well if I'm not now going to render this to Karma, we don't actually see our visualization geometry. One thing to note is that if we enable this data window right here, the image actually changes in the viewport. I assume this is a bug or this will be fixed at some point, probably when we have a proper dynamic data window right inside of uh, Karma or inside of Solaris. But if you are still working, you don't actually want to view your Karma node uh, this won't change the resolution, but the way that it's being displayed in the viewport, um, the final render is okay, render to M-Play is also okay. 
but the viewport rendering is a little bit screwed up. Here, as you can see, this, sh this shouldn't change, but it does. So let's take a look at how this actually works. So as I said, this is an HDA. So this is a collection of native Houdini tools that together create this data calculate data window tool. Currently, this is locked, meaning if I jump in, everything will be grayed out. But I'm going to allow editing of context by right clicking on the node. And now I can jump in and actually make changes. I don't want to make any changes, but I want to show you how this works properly. Let's dive into our HDA to find out how it actually works. So as you can see right here, we are currently in Solaris context. Diving in, we are still inside of a Solaris context, so no SOPs or um, any other contexts right now. And here, this is where our stage gets fed in, and this is where our stage gets fed out. So if we disable Visualize Window, our stage will go in and out without any changes. If we enable Visualize Window, you can see the switch switching to incorporate this scene right here, which imports from SOPS. All the cal calculations that we are doing are happening in SOPS. So let's jump into our object net right here. Here we have to use the lob import cam to bring our camera inside our object context, simply because VEX can't deal with the native USD cameras, but needs the normal Houdini cameras. Next, we are using a geometry network so we can get into SOPS, Go into the geometry network in Houdini. So let's jump in. Here in our geometry network, we are importing our scene and choosing the primitives that we have defined right here. Right now, everything that can be bound. And in this subnetwork, the actual calculations happen. Let's dive inside. Here, we are also feeding in our geometry and we are using the bound node which will create a bounding box. Because our scene is still completely packed, it's actually quite fast. So if we play this, this is happening in real time right now. If we disable real time, we can see we are going up to 100 frames sometimes. It's around 90 frames of playback speed. And next, we have our first attribute wrangler. Here we are using the to NDC function, which will take a camera, which is right here, our lob import cam. We are taking the position of each point and converting it to the normalized camera space. Let's go into the spreadsheet. And here we can see under points, here's our world position. And here is our normalized camera or screen space position. Next, we will find the maximum and the minimum value. For that, I'm simply using attribute promotes. And we're reading the original point attribute and we're giving out a detail attribute. Those can be seen here. So now we have our uh, camera space minimum values and our camera space maximum values. We need those minimum and maximum values because our bounding box can be oriented in all kinds of different ways or our camera can be can see this bounding box from all kinds of angles and we always need the minimum and the maximum let's go to the next attribute wrangle this is now set to detail meaning it only runs once so this also keeps us very fast right here we have our bounding box so we have always only eight points there is a slight cost to it of course but it is very lightweight so let's look at what we're doing here. First, we are defining our padding value. This is right here, padding. This will increase our bounding box by the specified percentage. Now we are reading out our minimum and our maximum vectors. Those are these values right here. Well, those are these values right here on our previous node. Here we are already stuff with it so we're reading them out next we are adding 
for subtracting the padding. For our minimum values, we need to subtract the padding. For our maximum, we need to add it to increase or decrease the position where it is. And here you can see that I've written a couple of uh, notes or comments. Um, this is because we need to do a few things to make sure that this is stable. I've noticed that in certain conditions it will crash. Some of that might be bugs that can be fixed in the future, but I'm not really sure if these are karma related, USD related, or if there was are limitations from EXR. Um, so first we have this here, right here. If this is below zero, the render will not start. If the minimum I value, this is this one right here is below zero, the render doesn't actually start. So this is hard coded to be zero or higher. Next, we have these clamp to the screen edges if desired. This means if our clamp to screen checkbox is set, meaning it is one, then our A and B values will be zero or one. We have already defined A and B right here, which are simple numbers that we subtract or add our padding to. This is for our clamping. Here we are actually clamping the values. Meaning if this was, if this is true, if we want to clamp to our screen edges, A and B will be 0 and 1. And if those aren't 0 and 1, if we don't want to clamp this to the, our screen edges, then these values are used where we have, again, 0, 1, but plus minus padding. So if you set the padding to 0 0.1, we can have an overscan of 0 0.1. But if you want to go further than that, you need to increase the padding. Next, we have a very weird if condition. Um, this is if the minimum y is negative and the minimum x is positive, then this crashes. I really don't know why. Um, but again, this is probably a bug that might be fixed at some point for Karma. So let's see what we're actually doing with that uh, workaround. Here you can see that our, when our cloth is up here, our data window comes to the edges. If we don't enable clamp to screen, meaning that we can allow an overscan, this jumps to the edges. This is because as soon as this value, the minimum y, is below zero and our minimum x is above zero, karma will crash. So even though our data window wouldn't need to be this big, I have to set it this big because otherwise it won't render at all. If you clamp the screen, we don't have the issue of the overscan, um, then we can keep the data window small. The next thing we're going to do is make sure that there's always a data window. For example, if your geometry is above the camera, then both minimum and maximum could be one or could be the same number. In that case, we couldn't actually render anything, and that also causes a crash. So if the minimum and maximum values are the same, we are going to specifically increase the data window, just so there are at least a few pixels that are going to be rendered, because if there's not, it will crash again. In the next and last step, we actually set the detail attributes. Right now, this is all happening. These variables are all happening in VEX, and now we are bringing those into our detail attributes. And these detail attributes are being read right here. And those are what actually drive the data window on our render product or in our render settings. The next thing we're going to look at is our visualization. Again, I have no idea how Python states work yet, so this is geometry. Um, Maybe in the future I will change this to actually be um, real guide geometry only visible when you are looking at or if you have selected this HDA, but right now it's geometry. Let's zoom out. You can already see we have four points right here. And these are the edges from our bounding box that we initially converted to our camera screen space, to our normalized camera screen space, now converted back into our world space. Here we are defining the depth variable and this is really just to change how far our geometry is being placed from the camera. Next we are reading out the detail attribute from here. So the same min and max values that we have here 
that we've calculated for our bounding box in screen space, those are being read right here into a minimum L and maximum R, meaning minimum left and maximum right. Here we are adding our depth to the Z, meaning the third value on our vectors. But right now we only have two points, the minimum left and the maximum right. So we need to define the next two points. Because they do share the same values, we can simply use our previous coordinates and change them around. In the next step, because this is still in camera space, we need to place this back into our word space. For this, we are going to use the from NDC function inside of VEX. Remember, here we've used to NDC, now we're bringing this back into word space. So for each vector, we're going to take our camera, the same as here, and we're converting this back to world position. Next, we simply add these four points, giving us these four points in world space. Next, I use the add node, which is simply, uh, which I simply set to polygons and by group, which will create a rectangle. And depending on what kind of visualization you want, you can either choose this, so we're passing this through, or we can use a sweep, which will create the border mode. Simply have to package this nicely, and now we have a beautiful HDA, which creates our data window. So here we are back in Fusion, just because I want to visualize something else. Um, in theory, this should work with every render engine that supports USD um, or that's supported inside of Solaris. But unfortunately, right now, the ones that I've tested haven't been so successful. So Karma CPU works fine. Um, Karma XPU, unfortunately, places the image wrong and also changes the pixel aspect. So if you play this, you can see how this warps around when the data window changes. Camera XP was still in alpha, so I assume in the future this will be fixed. Same issue or a similar issue with um, AMD's Pro Renderer, where this is where at least the pixel aspect stays the same, but um, the data window will be placed incorrectly inside the image, meaning our if our data window gets smaller, our pixels actually start, or our image actually starts to get smaller as well. So these are the two other engines I have laying around here. Um, I currently don't have Render Man installed or um, 3D Light or Redshift, but I would assume that at least uh, Render Man would work with that correctly. I think that Camera XPU will work in the future, but not right now. So if you are watching this video in the future, Maybe by now it's been fixed. I hope this was a quick and good demonstration and you found the information that you want. And I hope you have fun with the HDA and benefit from shorter render times. You can download this HDA if you go to the blog post I've linked below. Um, it will definitely be available on Gumroad for Houdini Indie users. Um, I will try to upload this to Orbold as well, which would convert this to the different licenses, meaning if you have Houdini FX or Houdini Core, it should work, but currently I can't upload this to Orbold because there is some error. But maybe if you're watching this in the future, it's already on Orbold. Um, but if you are a Houdini Indie user, you can download it today on Gumroad.